my interpretation is the godlike decisions are the ethical decisions. You know, there's the law, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, but, or thou shalt stop completely at the stop sign, right? Or you decide that you are going to, whatever, commit adultery or roll through the stop sign or whatever it is. Once you do that, that's an ethical decision, and that's a godlike decision. That's making a choice within consciousness of God's will. That's God's will, inshallah. Okay. This is, this is Jung's idea, right? Ethics and morals. Whereas yeah. Idea was morals and ethics. Right. Exactly. <laughs> But since this is a young reading group, please go back. We have to go by his rules. <laughs> please go back to Jung's article about conscience. Um, but, I mean, but this goes basically to this idea of the new dispensation of God, which is through psychology, through a psych psychological perspective. Okay, and and seeing it as we are the incarnation of God. And so we are making God-like decisions. And as I said last week, I really like that because I think if people start to think in terms of they are making God-like decisions, you know, even if the president thought that, he might start thinking about things a little differently. He thinks he is a god -like. That's the other thing. If he's so inflated, he thinks he is, he is making God-like decisions. Right, but he, he, but he has, yeah. I mean, he hasn't reached. He hasn't gotten past his own self. He hasn't. Uh, he's in. He's in a Yahweh mode, though. What leader that level has? Right, but okay. So there was Yahweh, right? And then the Jew. So before the Jewish dispensation. Before the Jewish dispensation, which was the law, there was Yahweh. Okay, and Yahweh is like an infant. You know, an infant has never been corrected, so it just behaves. Well, that to according. me makes it think. You know, you got these little tribes running around, and they're all just going over and just going, "I want that one." Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no recourse to anything except more violence, and so. You know, the Jews came up with, made some laws and said, these are the rules, we've got to play the game by these rules. That's just what I'm getting from what you're saying. Right. And so Yahweh was just like unbridled id or something. Yeah. And, and, and so, so the Jews made the laws. And but they also started consciousness in a way. That's yeah. When they, that's when the... the with the rabbis. They inserted, yeah. that's where they inserted something that, that was going over the Father. He said, you can't be Yahweh anymore. You've got, you've got to be servants or, you know, something else. Serv of servants of God. And, and in those days, 2,500 years ago, or I don't know, when was Moses? Well, Moses was 3,000 years ago. So in, in the days of Moses, um, you know, everybody was just whacking back and forth at each other with something. I mean, sticks. They they didn't have swords even it's at like that in time. City, yeah. Well, I, I mean, that, at some point, that's what Enger literally says. The the that Yahweh is like the um, is like the experience of the Iliad, which is um, you know just un unremitting tragedy it's the trojan war it's going back and forth and whacking back and forth at each other without thinking but now we have a global consciousness it's actually awakening since the year 2000 because of the internet so suddenly we have a global consciousness well think if you think like Back in the 1500s, there's Brunelleschi. He's doing he's doing this architecture. He's doing this linear representation of things where you, you put things in grids and stuff, and systematizing space and separating yourself away. Mm -hmm. So that's where we've been in the last 400 years, 500 years. Is, and some people are still that way. They, mm -hmm. 
that they are actually separate from things and they can objectively move and pull and do this and that. Ego consciousness. Mm -hmm. That that's all there is. And now we're going to move on. Now we're going to move on. And, and we're only the beginning of that. Okay, look, for the Christian dispensation, it took 325 years to write the damn Bible, right? I mean, the, the Council of Nicaea took place in 325 AD, and that was 325 years after Christ. Okay, so what do you remember that happened in 1690? You know? It's just a smidge. <laughs> <laughs> I was a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, think about it. I mean, here these guys are sitting in modern day Turkey, 325 years after Christ's life, and they're trying to put the Bible together, and they did. They put it together, and that's the Bible we have to this day. But they're talking about something that happened 325 years before them. And so, you know, they were making it up as they went along, honestly. And, you know, my, <clears throat> as I've always said, my criticism of Sagan and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson is that, you know, they were... They were so over on this scientific side and saying, oh yeah, there's nothing in this, in this psychological stuff at all. And they ignore the universe of everyone's psyche. And every one of those universes is different. Everyone. Okay, we have seven and a half billion psychic universes on this planet right now. And we have, we have no clue what's, uh, I mean, we might have a little bit of a clue among the four of us, but I don't know what we have about the rest of the world. I mean, I might have a little clue about what Indians think or what Saudis might think, but or Japanese, but um, you know, we, we have to start trying to understand what's in all those other universes somehow. And and that's the point. I mean, that's one of the PowerPoints in Answer to Joe. Whether you accept it for yourself or not, will you accept for the purposes of the reading room that Jung and Edinger were talking about an incarnate God, a continuing incarnation of God through the human being? Okay. I'm not asking you to make a per personal confession of faith. Okay? That's, that's Are you the, saved? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I'm still, I mean, Jung himself said at the end of his life, I'm still trying to work this stuff out. I have no, I have no final position on any of this stuff. And if anything, Edinger and, and his other followers made more, more clear final positions. I mean, he was talking about it for 60 years, and, you know, they, the people that were with him through that period, probably had a lot of experiences like this, and, you know, there are anecdotes about how he would sit around in, in restaurants and have conversations like this, so they probably all got it. And Edinger in the second generation, or even I guess he was in the third generation because he was Harding's student and Harding was in the second generation. It's not easy stuff to get. And, and yet, it, it's once you start to connect with it, it's pretty powerful and interesting. I mean, for me, it's, it's so interesting now since we started this group. I didn't know any of this stuff really, or a lot of it, before we started this group. I mean, I thought Jung's work was powerful and useful, and it's helped me in my life in many ways. Uh, and I knew that, but I didn't know this, okay? I mean, what, the way Edinger's put it together and, and talked about the new dispensation and all that stuff, I, that I didn't get.
He really shines a light. He really does, and it, it's just so powerful to me. Um, but it's powerful to me because I've done all the union reading. So, you know, from my point of view, okay, I can pick up any page of Young and read it and I'll get wisdom out of it and it'll make me feel good and good about myself in some way. I mean, it's like reading a page of the Bible, maybe, which is what Edinger says, right? Um, but, um, but to pull it all together is, is a big task. I mean, for that reason, I'm very grateful to this group for having pushed it along.